Well, greetings, viewers and voyeurs, and welcome. You've got that funk. I hope you're doing well. I do apologize for not having put a video on this channel for such a long time. I have no reasonable excuse for not doing so. I will strive to improve as the summer progresses, and I beg your in indulgence and patience. Anyway, I do put out videos every Monday on the Breakfast Club channel. If you're not already subscribed over there, I'd have to question why not. Please do so. I'll link that channel in the description box below. Also in the description box below, I'm going to link a video which I'm particularly proud of, which touches on the subject I'm going to be talking about in this video. And it would be a good idea if you pause this video to watch that one first because it will contextualize my statements in this video a lot better. Having said that, you don't need to watch that one to comprehend this one, but it'll help. Right, assuming that you've watched it, I'll go ahead and start with my topic. Um, about five years ago, my best friend The Bean and I went to Amsterdam together. And on our trip to Amsterdam, one of the things we did for recreation was we visited the Torture Museum in Amsterdam, where I saw dozens of different devices that were used on human beings for torture. And it's a pretty sobering experience when you're in a place like that and you're looking at all these archaic devices and you know that every single one you're looking at was actually used on a real person. And it makes you question the humanity of the people who think these devices up in the first place and also the humanity of the people who actually employed those devices in the cause of justice. Now one thing I learned when I was in the um, torture museum was that for the most part the crime that those devices were used for was the crime of blasphemy. You would get accused of blasphemy and if you protested your innocence they would torture you until you confessed. And then once you confessed, they would declare the torture a success because it has been proven that you were guilty because you said you were. That logic was actually the political zeitgeist of civilization in the Western world once upon a time. Concept of justice is by no means black and white. And it's still true that in the world today, there are different countries where the concept of justice is far removed from our concept of justice in the West. Take, for example, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Famously, they will cut off your hand for theft in Saudi Arabia. That's a form of corporal punishment. There are crimes in Saudi Arabia that you'll get lashes for. They'll whip you. Another form of corporal punishment. Uh, They'll execute you for being an atheist, or for being a witch, or for adultery, or for being gay, by chopping your head off. That's capital punishment, obviously, but it's pretty barbaric. And any form of corporal punishment, or any form of torture, in my opinion, is barbaric. But in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they call that justice. So, yeah, justice. It's not black and white. There's not a consensus worldwide uh, about what constitutes justice. So it's fair for all of us watching this video to disagree with me and my concept of justice because my concept of justice is probably pretty close to unique to me. Because I've always been an advocate for mercy to be a component of justice. Yes, I understand the reasoning, reasoning that uh, punishment should be a component of justice and I understand to a certain degree that retribution is a component of justice, but I also think justice should have a component of mercy. That being said, how do you know when to apply which? How do you know which is the more important component to apply in a particular case? Now, on the campaign trail uh, over the past few months, Bernie Sanders has been talking about his belief that um, we should get rid of minimum sentencing in America and that judges should have more discretionary power when it comes to sentencing criminals for certain crimes. Now, in principle, I agree with that. I think minimum sentencing or mandatory sentencing for particular crimes doesn't give a judge the power to assess all of the available information and determine a reasonable punishment or reasonable level of incarceration for a person. Having said that, to give a judge too much discretionary power opens it up to the case where, uh, you know, a judge is human beings like anyone else and he or she will have prejudices just like anyone else. And you might get a situation where a judge's prejudice, unconscious to the judge 
his or herself might lead that judge to give, say, def uh, defendant A, or no, um, convicted convict A, a harsher sentence than convict B, even though they both committed the same crime under similar circumstances. So that's a danger of giving a judge too much discretionary power. Um, now recently in the Brock Turner case, and for people coming to this video long after the fact, I will just briefly summarize. Brock Turner was convicted on three counts of sexual assault for raping a girl behind a dumpster at a frat party in uh, the Bay Area in California a few years ago. And the judge, and the minimum rec recommended sentence for the crime he was convicted of was two years in prison. The judge argued that two years in prison would be too detrimental to the young man's future and not serve justice or the young man uh, in any you know, reasonable capacity and therefore he should get a lighter sentence. And so the judge sentenced him to six months, not in prison, but in county jail. And a lot of people have been screaming about white privilege and about how, um, you know, this is a far too lenient sentence. They want the judge to be disbarred from the bench and all this kind of thing. And I'm not going to make a case for any of that stuff. What I am going to say is, my own opinion is, mercy and leniency has value, but you have to balance that against the crime. And when it comes to particularly serious crimes against a person, like rape or murder, there's no such thing as actual justice. If you rape someone or you kill someone, nothing that you do to the perp can possibly make up for what has happened to the victim. Nothing. So punishment is really more the only, the only method that you can employ because justice, you're never going to be able to take the trauma away from someone who's been raped. That's going to be with them, regardless of what you do to the perp. Whether you give them a lenient sentence or a harsh sentence, they're not going to get over the fact that they were sexually assaulted. You know, it's going to be there. Sure, they can push it down and bury it down, but it's going to come up every once in a while, and it's never going to be pleasant when it does. When it comes to murder, obviously you can't give someone their life back. Um, and I don't think that the, uh, the family of victims and everything should be taken into consideration when it comes to sentencing. I don't think there's a strong argument for that. I understand people have that view. I disagree with it. I think you know, you should be punishing someone for the crime they commit. But what do you do when someone takes a life? As an advocate against capital punishment, I don't believe in an eye for an eye. I don't believe that taking a life balances out the scales. I don't think the scales can be balanced when you take someone's life. Taking away someone's life for killing someone, in my opinion, is best served by letting them live a natural life in incarceration. You deprive them of their liberty forever. To me, that's justice because the person who's dead has been deprived of their liberty forever, but they've also been deprived of life. And I don't think that uh, one death can make up for another one. Anyway, as regards Brock Turner and the various people who think that his sentence was too lenient, I hear you. I do. I read the entire statement by the victim that she made after the sentence was passed down. And I think it's impossible to read that and not feel some level of empathy for what she went through and also come to the conclusion that the sentence just isn't reflective of the seriousness of the crime. To me, that's what it should be about. The seriousness of the crime should be taken into consideration. The likelihood that it may or may not happen again should be taken into consideration. And that secondary consideration I just mentioned comes down in, in many cases to the personality of the person who has been convicted. Now, in the case of Brock Turner, so far anyway, as, as far as I've read, he has not even really admitted that he's really done anything wrong. He wants to blow it off as, you know, he did it because he was drunk. It was, you know, he wasn't really in control of himself, which as I say, is complete bullshit. And if a perpetrator is not willing to face up to the fact that they're actually guilty of what they've done wrong, they deserve a harsher punishment. 
not a more lenient one. That's my opinion. Anyway, I want to thank you guys for watching this video. I look forward to a vigorous discussion in the comments section. Until next time, may all your ups and downs be ups.